Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, John. Good morning, Nancy, Diana. Um, good to have all of you here. Um, we're waiting for a couple of students to come. No, we have John right here. Okay, so good morning to all our faculty and our student. Um, we meet once again for uh, our mentoring hour, and uh, this is the place where we uh, discuss questions, um, share thoughts. Uh, the questions could be anything to do with what you've learned um, in Bible college, any questions with regard to uh, anything that you've meditated or anything on Christian living. Uh, this is what this is the time that we take. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Um, maybe I'll ask one of the faculties to open with a word of prayer because there are many of us here. Pastor Selena, could I request you to please open with prayer? Yes, Jean. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you, God, for the gift of life. We thank you for health and strength. We thank you that uh, yet another day we can experience your goodness, your faithfulness in our lives, Father, your favor over our lives, Father God. We thank you for this time. We pray that even as uh, uh, we um, uh, listen to the questions of the students, even as we answer them, you would give us the wisdom, God. We pray that it will be a good time of learning for uh, each one of us, that it will be uplifting and edifying, God. We thank you. We bless you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Selena. So we'll take time to start with questions. We have uh we have our, our faculty here and uh, we can um we can address questions you could put it up on the chat or just unmute uh, and, and speak i think uh, john paul has uh, brought about a question uh, do we have uh, any christian counseling certificate program in chrysalis um uh, so so john uh thanks for the question we've had one program. We've had a Christian counseling 101 uh, a couple of years back. I think it was in 2018. We did the basics in counseling skills, and it was a 12 week, uh, 12 week program where uh, we led uh, students through uh, the basics of counseling, very much like what we what we've kind of put forth in our course here in the Bible College. Uh, however, since that was in person, there was a lot. It was it was much longer. It had a lot more of uh, practical uh, sessions where uh, we did have mock live sessions also. So that's something that we did. Um, we would we are hoping to start that or do that once again um, in in the coming year. Uh, so yeah, so I think you could just keep your. However, it may be. Uh, offline because um, we do find that you know the the medium of uh, instruction for for anything uh, with Christian counseling or or you know even to build skills in counseling is better done in person because there is a, a lot more of um, skills that you that you build uh, just apart from what you say or how you say it but even the way that you attend and the body language and the expressions that you use. So uh, in all probability, when we do it, it is going to be uh, an offline. So yes, it is a basics counseling certificate program that we do have in Christmas, which we which we did. Uh, in fact, we did it twice, yeah, twice uh, in the, before COVID. So we hope to do it again in the coming uh, months or, or probably the next year too. Uh, we're keeping this the uh, open, and uh, yes, we could uh, have questions that that uh, you could put up either through the chat or you could unmute yourselves and uh, bring uh, bring up a question. So it's open. Uh, 
Um, maybe till we wait for questions, uh, I'm, I'm just having a look at our students. I think we have um, Nikki, we have uh, Brother Sri Kumar, and John. Um, so anybody, any of you would like to share anything specifically that you've learned through the last uh, couple of weeks in your course? It could be any of the subjects that you've learned, something that has uh, picked your interest or, you know, how, how God spoken to you or something that you've learned afresh. It would be nice if you could share that with the group here so that, you know, each one of us can be encouraged and also learn in turn. Uh, any of the students here, I think Herbert also has joined. Yes, Herbert, please go ahead. Okay, yes, good morning, Jean. Now, uh, when, I, um, when I was doing uh, some assignments, there are some assignments whereby you find that they say that uh, uh, type, in, type in your responses. Then uh, down, there are some steps which you, you after filling in the, the responses, then there is where the staff will grade, will put the grades. So uh, those questions were, some, were somehow challenging in that whenever you would finish them, then they, they would write for you complete, but they don't, uh, you cannot go to the next step. They say that to go to the prerequisite. Now, I wonder if those questions first need to, um, they first need to be viewed by the by the staff. Maybe to correct it, then it it enables me to the go to go to the next. Because I check, it shows me complete, complete, but it they say go to the prerequisite, and it's like in almost two papers. So, uh, you can give me some more advice on that. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Herbert. So, I suppose this is with regard to the e-learning course that you're doing. Is that uh, yes, with it, reference to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we have our expert here, Monica. Uh, Monica, would you be able to help Herbert with uh, with his query? On uh, he had uh, yes, Monica. Thank you, Herbert, for the question. So, uh, yeah, for the typing question, you need to correct it. So, I request my staff to uh, correct the question so that they can move forward for the next session. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Monica. Yes. So, uh, Herbert, uh, we'll ensure that the staff do um, for whatever type in questions that are there, that, uh, that there is the provision given for you to continue on. So, I think all of the staff who's given and type in questions to just uh, ensure that's there. And Monica, if you could just support the staff on, on that, uh, especially those papers uh, that's done, that would, uh, that would help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herbert, for that uh, feedback. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Then uh, the other time when we, the last meeting we were discussing about so maybe when people die, what happens? So I was asking myself now, uh, if some, if we, at uh, the end we all die and then maybe uh, we go to heaven and then we shall not go with our flesh instead our our souls now. Uh, then we have hopes to meet again. But then I was asking myself now, would we meet again like the way now we are meeting? We do meet again with now our families or we'll just be meeting like new people yes um, to the extent that you can even uh, not trust you not trace your family or whatever you maybe you make new family you make new friends you make new uh, new art yes that's what I, I kept on reflecting the, the, the other time when we, we stopped thank you okay. Thank you, Herbert. So I think Herbert's question was, um, when we die, uh, we would, for, as believers, when we go to heaven, would we recognize and have the same families that we are having down here on earth? Or would we have new families? Would we be put into new families? Would we recognize? Would we be able to trust? I think that's, that's a word that you used. Would we be able to trust and see and 
recognize the same families like how we do right now as we're living here on this earth. Um, yes, I'm opening this question to the faculty. Is there anybody who would like to address this question? Would we be able to recognize, know, uh, have the same families that we are having right now uh, as we hear how they have on earth, like when we go to heaven? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Herbert, for that question. Jean, I'll uh, share a few thoughts. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I, I understand that when we go to heaven, we will recognize people. Um, but then, you know, the way our relationships are here uh, on the earth, it won't be like that uh, up in heaven. Um, but, you know, we will recognize people and those relations like um you know how we are related to people that there's a sense of um remembering that uh why i say this is uh, because when we look at the example in luke chapter 16 of uh, poor lazarus and the rich uh, man uh, they both die so over there you uh, notice that the rich man he he knows that his relatives have still not uh, you know big come right with God. So he has that burden uh, for them and he's still sort of yearning for um, them to uh, do the right thing while they are alive. Mm. And um, yeah, but but then we, we uh, see in another passage, uh, I'm just searching for that passage. Yeah, it's Matthew 22, where it says uh, in the resurrection, people will neither marry nor uh, give in marriage. So, you know, we, we won't be trying to pursue um, the relationships like getting married and things like that up in heaven, but we will know who our family members were uh, when we were here on the earth. So those are my, that is my understanding. Uh, if someone else could add to that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to add to what Pastor Nancy has uh, brought about? Herbert, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good. It's okay. Um, then uh, another challenge which I had, I was reading about deity. Now, I remember I read somewhere deity of God that it is the three persons in one, uh, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then I, I saw somewhere also the death of Jesus. Now, I asked myself, does he, he does also have the, the deity? Is, is so I couldn't understand very well uh, the deity of Jesus. Someone can enlighten me about the deity of Jesus. Um, uh, how about I'm just, just clarifying your question? You wanted to know about the deity of Jesus in the death of Jesus. Is that is was that your question? Um. Yeah, just the de 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 deity, the deity of, of Jesus. Jesus, the deity of Jesus. Yes. Okay. Mm, All right. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Pastor? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so Herbert. So, what the Bible teaches us, the Bible um, teaches us about um, a triune God, and we, I think, we spoke about this um, last class. You know, where in the beginning God said, "Let us." create man in our own image you know so he there's a word plural uh, there's a plural uh, let us and so throughout the scripture um, in a sense the bible presents a triune god god the father god the eternal word and god the holy spirit and um, there are three distinct persons that means god the father is god and god the son and god the holy spirit are distinct pers persons and um uh, and yet they are one. The Bible refers to this as the Godhead, Romans chapter one, the Godhead, right? Um, and each person of the Godhead is equally God and fully God. So God, the eternal word, is not one third God. He is fully God. That means all of the Father, all of the Spirit, 
is expressed and revealed in God, the eternal word. So similarly, God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Father. Right? So that's why many times the Bible uses terminology like talking, referring to the Holy Spirit. The Bible refers to God, the Holy Spirit as the glory of the Father or the Spirit of Christ. You know, because the Holy Spirit fully represents Christ and also the Father. And um, so this is the Godhead. There's unity. There's love in the Godhead. In John chapter 17, you could see that there is community or love in the Godhead. Now, when and, and, and the three main attributes of deity, which is omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence, you know, all powerful, all knowing, all present. Each person of the Godhead has that. Now, in the incarnation, when the God, the eternal word, became man in the incarnation, he chose to walk as a man. Now, he didn't cease being deity in essence. He, that was God, the eternal word, who became man. But in the incarnation, he laid aside his powers of deity, that is omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, and he walked as a man. Right? And he walked anointed by God the Holy Spirit. And he walked com in complete submission to God the Father. So this incarnate being was always eternal because it's God, the eternal word, who became man. So it's not that his birth was his beginning, never. He always had a, He was always there. But this being, who the incarnate one, we refer to as, the Bible refers to as the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So he is deity clothed in humanity. But when he walked the earth, he walked without the powers of deity. He walked as a man. But remember, the Godhead always existed. That means it's not like when God came into the earth, there was nobody in heaven. No. God the Father was there. God the Holy Spirit is everywhere. Right? So... But this person, Jesus Christ, the eternal word became human, walked without the, the attributes of deity, walked as a man, but in submission to the Father and under the anointing of God the Holy Spirit. And then he lived as a man. That means he grew, in incre he increased in wisdom, and in stature. That means he increased in his learning. That is, he slowly understood who he was, what was his mission, what was the Father's will, just like, a, like, just like all of us. He grew in wisdom and he increased in stature. That means physically he grew, right? So, uh, and, and this is such an amazing part that the eternal one who created all things would subject himself to a process of growth and development. The omniscient one would sub submit himself to a process of learning. You know, the omnipotent one would submit himself to a process of growing strong. But that's, that's what happened in the incarnation. And then he lived as a man, everything happened as a man, and he died on the cross. And he was buried, he rose up again, third day. He ascended. When he went back into heaven, what happened? He took on all the attributes of deity. So today, he is still the eternal word. But he's also the son of God, meaning the one who lived on the earth and went. So if you look at it, the eternal word before the incarnation did not have a physical body. A bo physical body meaning, I'm not talking about flesh and blood, but I'm talking about a, 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 a body. Uh, he has a, what we would refer to as a, a, a spirit body. But after the ascension, after the uh, ascension, he ascended with a body, not a flesh and blood body, but a body that was of a different material. But in that body, the Bible says in Colossians two, the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. That means you know all of the Godhead is contained in that body. That's in the eternal word, the Son of God. So we refer now we call him the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, you know, the Good Shepherd. All these titles are given, but he's the eternal word who became incarnate man, who today is exalted as God. Right? He he even back and he took on his powers of deity. So that's you know, if you want to talk about the deity of Christ, today is he deity? Yes. Was he deity on earth? Yes. 
Was he deity before? Yes. The difference is when he walked on the earth, he did not walk in the attributes of deity, but he took that on after his exaltation. Is that okay? That's Christology in 30, 60 seconds. Sorry. Herbert, I hope that answers your question. Yes, okay. yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you, Herbert, for that question. Yeah, the, it is open for further questions. Um, you could please put this up on the chat or even unmute and bring about your question. Uh, while we wait, uh, would, would anybody like to share anything that they've learned or uh, something new that they have understood through the classes or um, anybody, any of the students can open this up for the faculty also. If you'd like to just bring up any specific thoughts or through your study of, of the word or through your teaching as, as students to bring up questions. If there's anything that uh, you'd like to highlight, you're welcome to. Okay, opening this to the students. Um, anybody would like to bring up a question or even even a learning? That's fine. Uh, Rupa, Milagris, Kiran, Anita, John. Anybody? Yes, yes, uh, Nikki, please go ahead. You could unmute and. Good morning. Uh, so I, I just had a small doubt or clarification. Now, when we look at wisdom in the Bible, it's, uh, I was reading Proverbs chapter 8, so that's where the reference is Proverbs 8. And it almost talks of wisdom as a completely different being as such. And uh, it also has very similar attributes of what the Holy Spirit would give you. And it also talks about, uh, like the last verse of Proverbs 8 says, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and they that hate me love death. So I was just wondering, like it talks about obtaining wisdom, getting wisdom. Wisdom was there before, like from the beginning. and. Uh, so how do we look at wisdom or how do you obtain wisdom? We know about the Trinity. So when we, we also know the Holy Spirit, if I'm not mistaken, the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. So how do you actually attain wisdom or what is wisdom in a sense? Is it something that is even, uh, it's a little difficult question in my head. Is it something completely different or do you get it through the Holy Spirit? What, how do you really attain wisdom? That would be my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholson. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, Can I, Pastor. Sorry, yes, sure. I, don't, I don't mean to take all the questions, but I just that's a very interesting question. So uh, thank you, Nikki, for asking it. Yeah, so in Proverbs 8, um, or, you know, in Proverbs, so, so, so the Bible is written in many different literary styles. Right, and uh, one of the literary styles, or one of the ways of writing or communicating something, is personification. That means something that is not a person is personified in order to communicate something. So, for example, wisdom is not a person in the sense that, and uh, Christ is wisdom. So that you know, I, I don't want to argue on that, but I'm just saying when you talk about wisdom, it's we're talking about a certain attribute, a virtue. Uh, but in Proverbs 8, wisdom is personified. I like that, you know, you have many, many, uh, many uh, 
examples in, in the Bible where certain things that are uh, intangible are actually personified, are, 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 are pretended to be a being. And then through personification, certain insights about that is communicated. So that's Proverbs 8. You know, so wisdom is speaking as a being, you know, or in, even in chapter one, wisdom stands at the corner of, in the center of the city and it calls out to all the people come and follow, you know. So wisdom is being just personified. Uh, in order to communicate something. So that's basically, you, you see that in the book of Proverbs. So to answer your question, what is wisdom? It is the ability uh, to use knowledge or information uh, to do something meaningful. The you know, example would be to solve problems, to uh, create or come up with new ideas, new designs, strategies. It's Wisdom is the ability to put knowledge, to make use of knowledge for constructive purposes. So that in a sense is wisdom, the ability to use knowledge, right? Now, how does wisdom come from? It's at three sources that we see. One, uh, of course, all, all wisdom comes from God. So how, you know, is God is wisdom. He is your source of wisdom, but how does he give it to us? Three, one, it's through his word. Right. So the word of God is the wisdom of God. Uh, Proverbs chapter two, I think it's verse four or verse six. It says, out of his mouth comes wisdom. Out of his mouth. So that is God is a source of wisdom. His word is wisdom. That's why you know, even in, 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 in Psalm 119, the psalmist says, you know, through your word, you've made me wiser than my enemies. You know, and so many scriptures. So God's word is wisdom. Second. So that that wisdom comes as we receive the word and understand, receive the mind of God through the word, right? So I'm not just saying just read the word because a lot of people read the Bible, but they don't have any wisdom. Then you wonder what's happening. That's because that the scriptures, the reading of the scriptures has to be understood and the mind of God has to be embrace through the word, right? But the word of God is one way by which God releases his wisdom to us. And then through that word, we know, okay, what we should do, what we should not do, what is the decision to make, all that. The second source of wisdom is imparted wisdom, which comes through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So Isaiah chapter 11, verses two, and several other scriptures, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of wisdom. So God, Holy Spirit, moving on us, he fills our minds. He gives us the ability to understand, to discern, uh, to solve problems. And, uh, and so it comes through the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and many times, you know, in the, the New Testament talks about the gift of the word of wisdom. That means uh, he gives it to us, right? Uh, for a particular situation, suddenly the understanding comes, this is what I must do. So the Holy Spirit gives us that wisdom. Um, now, as a believer, we are positioned to receive both, right? So we are in Christ, and 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, Christ is made unto us wisdom from God. So as a believer, we are positioned to receive divine wisdom. Uh, Colossians uh, 2 uh, verse 3, you know, it says, In Christ are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then the Bible says we are in Christ. So that means we are positioned to access the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The third way wisdom is gained is through experience. So that means we journey through life, we walk with God, we go through life situations, and then what happens? We become wiser, as we, you know, that's provided we are learning through life experiences. Some people go through life and life happens to them and they don't learn anything, then there's no wisdom. But the point is, as you're journeying through life, you keep learning then you're becoming wiser, right? You're, you're, you're learning through life experiences, you become wiser. And that is where mentoring comes in. Like when you are mentored by somebody, what happens? You are taking advantage of their years of experience and you're getting all of that in a condensed form. That means you don't have to go through 20 years to learn that. You can learn that in two minutes, so long as you know we are willing to listen to what they say. because. In two minutes, they can communicate what may have taken 20 years to learn, right? So it, uh, experience, personal experience and learning from the experience of other people imparts 
divine wisdom. So the Bible says, he who walks with the wise will be wise. You know, so that's iron sharpening iron. That's in Proverbs. So what are we doing? We are drawing from the wisdom of other people. So three sources of wisdom. What is wisdom? It's a good sermon to preach, Nikki. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pastor. So, you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, just to add to that, so am I right in assuming that uh, people who are not believers or don't have the word of God have gained their wisdom purely through experience and we have the untapped word of God and the Holy Spirit to give us things that they mm. probably don't have uh, reached to it. Yeah, true. So, um, they, they, they have wisdom that is acquired. The third one we said, they have the acquired wisdom which uh, for, the, for the natural things, but they may not have wisdom in the matters of God or the things of the Spirit of God. Yeah. But we can also learn from them. For example, you know, there's nothing wrong. You know, if somebody who is not saved, but has got experience in some practical aspect of life, you know, of course, we go and talk to them. We consult with them. Why? Because they have acquired experience in that matter. It may not be spiritual, uh, but it's a very practical matter. So we can learn from them and we shouldn't despise that. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Nicholson, for the question. And thank you, Pastor, for that. That was, that was a, a short nugget and that's so helpful. Um, opening out this for any further questions from our students. Thank you, Dinah, for uh, for that. Uh, she's put up a gist of um, what Pastor just spoke about, the sources of wisdom. Uh, you could quickly go through that and um, jot down your notes too. Anybody would like to share? Any thoughts, bring up questions, could just quickly unmute and um, bring your question. Or if you'd like to share a testimony, share of God's faithfulness, you could take a couple of minutes to do that while we wait for. Apologies. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, I think I lost my connection for a bit. Yes. Uh, uh, Deepak, would you like to just share maybe anything that you've learned? Anything, any testimony, anything? Or Anita? Any thoughts of, of the faculty? Anything you'd like to share as part of your class? Any questions? Uh, look in here, would also be welcome. So it's a quiet morning. Uh, Isaac, Isaac, I think, uh, would you like to uh, maybe unmute and share anything that you would you've picked up or learned through this week or any specific question that you may have. Sorry that I'm bringing up names because we don't seem to have any responses. So uh, just a little nudge. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah can I say something? Go yeah, ahead. I'm just, coming, I'm just coming on to the 
mentoring hour and uh, picking from what uh, Pastor has just said about knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge, I think I got some very good insight. And then I'm just preparing my note on the book of James. And James was talking about the difference between worldly knowledge and godly wisdom. So I think uh, he threw a, little, a good light on that, that he said, uh, believers can have godly wisdom and unbelievers can have worldly wisdom. I think this is what I got from him, and I think it's very important. Thank you, man. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, hi, uh, Pastor. Uh, um, sorry, Milagros, can I take your question after uh, Nicholson? Yes, of yeah. course. Nicholson, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, you. Yes, Nicholson, go uh, ahead. Just wanted some practical advice um, in church. So, here, uh, as you all know, it's been, I think, just over a year since Benita and I took over the church. Uh, and there's scenarios where there are uh, other members leaving from other churches for whatever reason, and sometimes they end up in our church. And it's a very tricky situation where you don't want to offend that pastor, but at the same time you can't, I mean, personally, I don't think I can tell them, leave the church. And um, I've of course told them, go back to your pastor, settle whatever issues you have to, and try and resolve it. But it's been a back and forth with one particular person that he wants to come to our church, but he doesn't want to go back to his church. And his pastor is quite upset, of course. It's a small town. So he's made that very clear to me. How, how do you go about situations like this? And what is the right way to go about it? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Nicholson, for that question. Um, I'm opening this out to... Uh, to our pastors. Um, Pastor Rashish, may I throw that question to you, please, to be able to handle that? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, Nikki, um, this is a, a, a challenge um, that we face, uh, you know, I guess all pastors face in every city. Um, so what we have tried to, I mean, what we've learned and what we've tried to practice here at APC is, uh, so when we know that people have left one church and they've come here, um, just like what you said, uh, we encourage them to, you know, to at least inform or in some way, you know, leave on good terms. You know, we see we cannot, uh, people have the freedom to make their choice. We, we cannot override their choice and we don't want to dictate their choice. So if somebody chooses to go from church A to church B, that is their choice. You know, we can't dictate it, but what we can do is we can encourage them saying, okay, you know, hey, did you leave in, on good terms? Did you inform your previous pastor that you're, you're changing for whatever the reason is? You know, and sometimes the reasons may be genuine. You know, they moved to another part of the city or the service timings or language or so many, so many things are there, but leave on good terms. And, uh, uh, See, that's all we can do. You know? Now, if they don't want to go back or they refuse to go back and say, no, no, something bad happened, this and that, uh, we say, okay, at least give a written letter to that church. So they don't may, may not have to meet that pastor personally. That's the best option. But if they're not able to do that, at least in a letter or an email, you know, in a very politely written saying, you know, thank the pastor for whatever he has done because of course, over the years, he would have imparted into their lives. So you thank him, appreciate him for that and leave you know, in a nice way saying, we have decided to move to this church. It is completely our decision. It was not influenced by the pastor of the other church. So uh, just a small letter sent to that church office uh, brings a, a nice closure to their time with them and you can welcome them here. Now, from a pastoral side, uh, think of a couple of things. One is you are not responsible for their decision. So don't think bad about yourself. I mean, you didn't go out there and force them to move here, right? It was not 
uh, you didn't do it. So don't hold yourself responsible for that. That was entirely their choice. Secondly, you are not responsible for the other pastor's inability to let them go. You're not responsible for that. That is his reaction and you cannot control his reaction, right? So now, uh, now in the same way, there will be people who leave our congregation and go to another church. So as pastors, of course, we have, we feel, why did they leave? What did I do wrong? <laughs> did I say something? You know, all those questions come. But one thing that always helps me is, hey, thank God, we all belong to the same kingdom. You know, so if they go from APC to any other church, hey, they're still part of the same kingdom. They haven't left the kingdom. They haven't left the family of God. They've just, church, they've just changed congregations. That's all. So I just tell myself that and I, I stay at peace. So, you know, so the other pastor's inability to handle the situation, you know, uh, is not your responsibility. So your conscience is clear. You can sleep at night. All right. I'll uh, leave some time for the other question now. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Mickey, for that question. Um, Milagros, we'd be delighted to hear your question. Kindly unmute, please. And you could give us your question or your thoughts. Uh, yes, Pastor, I just had a small question. Uh, question. I just wondering about the on-campus uh, classes for fall semester. So I just want to know if that will be a possibility on the next semester or we maybe have to wait more. Was your question on the classes, uh, classes or online classes? Um, um, no, if it will be available on campus classes next semester. On e okay, e-learning, e-learning. No, no, no. Um, she's asking. No, uh, I mean, on campus. On campus, yeah. So, yes. uh, Mil so Milagros, we are, we will be opening from August 1st on campus. Um, uh, so the answer is yes. And our campus will be open from August 1st. Um, the only uh, issue is, um, you know, we don't know how um, other countries or you know, what's happening in other countries. But um, yeah, you know, we can send you a letter for you to apply for a visa. I mean, if you if you just send an email to the college, uh, we can send you a letter. You can apply for a visa, but uh, uh, you know, so to that to to that extent, we can help you. We can send you a letter, and then you could see you know what happens with the Indian consulate uh, in your country uh, uh, when you try to apply for the visa. Uh, but the answer is yes, On ca campus will open from August 1st. Perfect. Thank you, Pastor. I would really appreciate the letter. I have, um, I am um, the, well, the embassy asked me for admission letter. Uh, I think maybe that will be easy. But the other uh, letter or document I need is a uh, uh, certificate of, reg uh, of registration, uh, registration, I'm sorry, uh, of the institution in this case. Uh, I, I don't know if that, uh, I don't know if you have that document or maybe I can ask the embassy for more detail. Mm. Yeah, so... Uh, we can send you, you know, a, a letter about so the church. Our church is a religious organization, yeah. and we can send you a letter describing the registration of the church, and which runs the Bible College. Um, and uh, yeah, and let's see what happens. You know, how the embassy handles that. Perfect. Thank you very much for your help. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, you Melagros. Um, we have a couple of minutes, around five minutes. Um, maybe uh, another question time for one more question. Um, so opening this out for, to the students for a last question. For on, okay, I think Herbert's asked a question. For on campus, do we have dormitories uh, for students. Yeah, Herbert, so, uh, so right, right now we have a dormitory for men, which is, uh, I think we, uh, about 
40 students can stay there. It's a dorm dormitory. And then we have a, it's in the same building. And then the, we, we used to have a separate building for the ladies dormitory, you know, a ladies hostel. Now we gave that up uh, because, you know, the, everything was closed for two years, <laughs> two years, yeah. Uh, but what we will be doing is before August 1st, we will take up a separate building for girls hostel, girls dormitory. Now this previous girls dormitory was, uh, could hold only about 13 students. Uh, but uh, depending on how many students, ladies, ladies students are coming, we will take up uh, another building for dormitory. So there will be the dormitory style, but then students are free to stay uh, in, in uh, you know, like in their own place. You can, so you could rent uh, a one bedroom apartment or two bedroom and share it with other students. Uh, in and around, you know, uh, around the Bible College area, so that option is also there if you want to rent. And so, so the dormitories, of course, you know how it is. It's like bunk beds, and a lot of students are there together. So some students may want their own privacy, so then they can rent uh, smaller apartments uh, for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay, awesome. thank you, Pastor. Mm, thank you, Pastor. Um, I was, <laughs> I was thinking of uh, now when we finish our studies at APC, uh, you people are there some employment opportunities at the APC says maybe as we 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 finish our certificate, so diplomas, uh, is there accessibility of uh, um, maybe a person coming and it becomes employed and maybe to earn a living from APC College. Thank you. Yeah, so I will try to answer this very quickly. Um, so there are two, two things um, that would be available. See, one is within India. So if you are a student from India, uh, or we, if for every every batch, you know, we, we see who are the good students and then we give them opportunity to work with the church. And actually many, many, many of the people who are working with the church are students who have graduated with us or we help them go and start churches in around the country, right? So that's for those who are students within India. For overseas students, uh, we, you know, we're just having our first batch of overseas students graduate, a big batch that they'll be graduating next year. Uh, what we are setting up is uh, another organization called APC World Missions. So that will be, so, the, so the, the, the problem we have is um, we cannot send money out outside from here. We cannot send money out of India. So we, what, you know, we can support and employ people and do all of that within India. But what we are setting up is APC World Missions. It's, it'll be an organization set up in the U.S., and from there, we are going to support our international students who graduate with us if they want to work, you know, anywhere outside India, which are in their own country, for example. So our plan is to get all of that ready before the graduation next year. That means our first international, a batch of international students will be graduating in uh, next year, 2023. And for them, APC World Missions will be available to help them, support them, uh, whether they are starting churches or ministries and so on. But of course, there are there will be certain conditions. One is uh, we want students to complete three years of study with us, right? So they should complete their three years of study because only then we know they are really well trained. Uh, secondly, uh, they should have a good, good uh, ministry plan. So we will have a proposal which they will submit. They will write up, you know, what they want to do maybe start a church, maybe start some ministry in their city, maybe, you know, go and do something. So they need to give us a good, clear plan. And then based on these two things, you know, uh, and of course, the third thing is we, we will observe our students, you know, whether they're studying with us online or um, they're studying with us on campus or even our e-learning students, you know, we can see how you know, we, we, we see, we assess the students, you know, they're really genuine, they're really serious. So, you know, these three are, these three things are important criteria. You know, they should finish three years with us. They should submit a proposal of what they want to do. 
and third is uh, they should be good students meaning uh, not in in the terms of academics but in terms of spiritual life you know that they really are called by god then apc world missions will support them help them start and then we have another organization that we're setting up which is called pastors and ministers fellowship international where our students will be part of it so that we can provide them spiritual uh, guidance you know so uh, that we can continue to uh, to uh, care for them spiritually so they graduate from a bible college and then these two things will be available apc world missions and pastors and ministers fellowship international uh, and um, it is optional we are not forcing anybody to join but these are opportunities we are making available for our students i hope i answered your question thank you pastor uh, herbert we trust that was helpful uh, we close for today. Before we close, just an announcement that we will not be meeting for Supernatural Art tomorrow. Being Good Friday, we encourage you to um, be at your local church or if you're in Bangalore, consider visiting and worshipping with us as well. Um, Pastor Paul, may I kindly request you to close with a word of prayer, please? Sure, Jean. All right, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this wonderful time, Lord, where we could get together and uh, just pour out our hearts and uh, hear from you, oh God. We want to thank you for the wisdom that you've given each one of us. And I pray, God, that you will continue to fill us, Lord, continue to empower us, uh, continue, Lord, to use us in every area of our lives, Lord. We pray that, Lord, we will truly be the salt and light that you have called us to be, Lord, wherever we are, God. Uh, Lord, we pray for the students as well, oh God, even as they prepare uh, uh, for their coming assessments, Lord. I pray that you will be with them and strengthen and minister to them, Lord, even as they prepare, oh God. We thank you for this wonderful time. Uh, we commit this day, uh, the rest of the week, into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you, faculty. Thank you, students. Have a good day. God bless.